Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm uh, Vice President for External Relations here at, at CSIS. And um, it is such a pleasure to be hosting this really unique event. Um, Ms. Armstrong is still on her way. She's stuck in traffic, but she will be here in a few minutes. So we thought we would just get started. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just uh, thank you for being here. Um, give thanks to uh, UPF, the, United, uh, the uh, Unity Productions Foundation, and of course to the Charter for Compassion. Uh, before we um, go any further, I'd like to show you a, a quick two-minute clip about the Charter, and we're going to show that right now. This is an image of how the world can be. We posted drafts of the text for the Compassion Charter online. We then gathered together people from the five different major religions. Analyzing, writing, critiquing the language there to synthesize all of this into the powerful document that now has unified us all across the globe. Bring compassion back to the center of religion and from that point activate the rest of the world. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, illegal, spiritual, ethical, human beings all over the world must be cared for. We have information at our fingertips, and that information is pushing us to do something about what's going on around the world. We are at a critical juncture in history. The environmental crisis, the food crisis, the financial and economic crisis. Something is fundamentally wrong. We are living in a period of commercial globalization. What we really need is spiritual globalization. Of course, we'll be hearing more about the Charter for Compassion in just a few minutes. Um, again, welcome to CSIS. For those of you who have never been here before, I'm very happy to see you here, and I hope you come back. Um, we host all kinds of interesting programming here, but probably none that are that is as important um, as this event we're having tonight. And I feel truly um, blessed to see all of you here uh, and have all of you here with us. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, Alex Cronomer, who's the executive producer of the film. Uh, he's going to come up and deliver a few quick remarks. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague, Ambassador-designate uh, Rick Barton, who's going to be joining, leaving CSIS shortly and joining the UN. I don't know where Rick is, but I know he's here somewhere. Um, Rick has led our post-conflict and reconstruction program. There he is. Rick, could you stand up and just... Rick has led our post-conflict reconstruction here, uh, program here at CSIS. And if you want to talk about someone who has compassion, um, 
Rick Barton is someone who has compassion, and he's going to be representing the United States very soon in New York working with Susan Rice. Um, I urge you to go to our website, CSIS.org, and you can look in the post-conflict reconstruction program area for some of the work Rick, Rick has done uh, with religion and society and conflict. It's, it's a very, some very compelling work. Uh, it's been circulated widely throughout the United States government, and I hope that you have a chance to visit it uh, while you're here. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dahlia Mogahed, who you will see in the film later. Dahlia is here. Um, Dahlia is the wonderful person who, le who led uh, this fa fascinating poll um, that the film is based on. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you again for being here, and I'd like to introduce Alex. Uh, good evening. Well, as I look out to this uh, nice interfaith audience, I should probably begin with appropriate interfaith greetings. So let me wish everyone the peace and blessings of God. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. And everybody else in the audience, go skins. <laughs> um, I am going to, uh, a little later on, introduce the film. Uh, but what I'd like to do right now is uh, introduce... Uh, a gentleman who's going to begin the evening appropriately by reading the, cha uh, the Charter for Compassion uh, to all of you so that we are, uh, know why we're here and what we're gathered to experience and, and the goal uh, that the Charter really is laying out for all of us uh, to help work for a better and more peaceful world. Um, the gentleman who is going to be doing this is a man by the name of uh, Dr. Zaire. He is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon in clinical practice in Northern Virginia. But more importantly, he is a humanitarian. He is the current president of AMANA, which stands for the Islamic Medical Association of North America. He represents AMANA in promoting a greater awareness of Islamic medical ethics, and he is at the forefront uh, in providing humanitarian and medical relief nationally and internationally. Uh, it's a great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Zahir to the podium to read the charter. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a uh, privilege to be here. Um, thank you, Alex. As physicians, uh, we are called upon to do everything we can to help our patients, regardless of their ideology or background. As Muslim physicians, we see this type of compassion and care as an act of worship and a divine responsibility given to us by God. Though we are human beings, the ultimate result is always in the hands of the Almighty God. And the best that we can do is deliver the excellent care that we can, as well as pray for them and with them for their health and well-being. As president of the Islamic Medical Association of North America, I am honored to participate in today's launch of the Charter for Compassion and wish Ms. Armstrong the best in reaching our common goal of compassion. Now I'd like to read the Charter. I hope everybody can hear me. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religions ethical and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there, and to honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being, treating everybody without exception with absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathetically from inflicting pain, to act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest, to impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody, and to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies, is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion, to return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate, to ensure that youth are given accuracy, I'm sorry, accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, and cultures, to encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity, to cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings, even those regarded as enemies. 
We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world. Rooted in a principled determination to transcend, transcend selfishness, compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideologic, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential to human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path of enlightenment and indispensable to the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. Thank you. Uh, those were very beautiful words. Let's please give those words one more round of applause. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, uh, Ms. Armstrong. Uh, let me just say a few words. First of all, I, I, I have uh, known her now for many years. She was, uh, as many of you may know, the star of our documentary, Muhammad Legacy of a Prophet, which has now been seen by over 150 million people worldwide. Um, our biggest, yes. But I, I, I wanted to say in a personal, she really gave us a lot of trouble when we were making the documentary, mainly because she was so good in her interview that when we were in the editing room, we, we, we kept you know, having a hard time cutting you down. We'd cut it down and then we'd had to add more of your bites in. It was really a struggle. Um, but you really did carry that show. You really uh, communicated the ideas that we wanted to communicate very well. I'm internally grateful for you and I'm very happy to be able to say a few words about you tonight. Um, from the beginnings of her career as a thinker, writer, an ethicist, Karen Armstrong has exhibited the primary quality of a first-rate mind, and as the Buddhists would say, a great soul. And that essential quality is having a heart with the capacity to grow, to be able to build on her intellectual epiphanies and spiritual discoveries, and to express them engagingly, so that we who are her readers and her fans can journey with her and ourselves grow from her experiences and insights. Uh, in retrospect, uh, the destination probably was always evident from the themes of her many books, such as The History of God, or Muhammad, A Biography of a Prophet, or uh, The Great Transformation, just to mention a few. But with the, with the launch of the Charter for Compassion, we can all see clearly that her journey has always been towards the heart of the divine, which is to say, it has always been towards the universal idea of compassion. The centrality of compassion is embedded in all the world's major religions. Yet for the followers of all the world's major religions, it remains an ideal that is sometimes very difficult to realize. It is then qu really quite a good thing that Karen Armstrong not only brought us to this realization that the heart of religion is compassion, but that she is working here tonight and around the world through the Charter for Compassion to help bring about the necessary condition for compassion to thrive. And that is the creation of community and the establishment of a foundation for companionability among the people of different faiths. Karen, we are here tonight to support those efforts, uh, to honor you for all that you've done and for what you will be doing, and to continue the journey with you. It is my great honor and distinct pleasure to introduce Karen Armstrong. Everyone, Karen Armstrong. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you tonight on the, the launch of the Charter uh, because the work that UPF doing are doing is really so much uh, in the spirit of the Charter, to try to break down stereotypes in an imaginative way, uh, to, to uh, present Muslims to a world uh, as human beings, like everybody, as we all are in an age where Muslims are so often demonized and misunderstood. It's something that is very close to my own heart and I'm so thrilled to see my friend Dahlia again. Um, and I know you're going to, this film, um, the work that they've done uh, in um, 
trying to, again, to, to counter the misunderstanding and prejudice and put a balanced view forward. It's crucial. And so there could not be uh, a more fitting way to, for me to spend this evening uh, to be with you tonight. With, because the, when I got this prize, I won, I won a prize. Um, and I heard about it in an email that told me I'd won the TED Prize. And I'd never heard of TED at this stage. Um, I wondered who on earth TED was, um, Fred or Sid. Uh, but I found out more about this wonderful institution. Now I can't imagine how my life was without it. Uh, they give you some money, but they also give you a wish, a wish for a better world. And I knew at once what it was that I wanted to do. Um, because, as Alex has just said, um, all, all my studies of the major faiths has pushed me constantly towards compassion. It lies at the heart of all the faiths. Uh, it's, the, it's not only the test in all faiths of true spirituality, but it's also the way in which we come into communion with what we call God or Brahman, Tao, Nirvana, the ultimate. Uh, it breaks down ego. When I was a young nun, uh, we did all kinds of exercises to bring down our ego, our sense of self. I had to crawl around on the ground and kiss people's feet and meditate endlessly on my sins and confess them in public. And this was all a complete waste of time <laughs> because these kind of exercises simply embed you in the ego that you're trying to transcend. You just be we become so uh, sort of preoccupied with your own performance that your eyes are continually on the self. And um, it's compassion that does it, where, as, I, as the Charter says, you dethrone yourself from the center of your world and put another there, that you look into the eyes of the other and you see the divine and you see yourself, because we are all one. We are bound together uh, as never before, electronically, education, uh, economically, um, financially, politically. We found out to our cost that what happens uh, in Gaza today can have repercussions tomorrow in New York or, or London. Uh, troubles are no longer something that happens on the other side of the world. We are all in the same predicament. We're facing uh, the possibility of environmental catastrophe. Um, and we are, are deeply polarized. There's a profound uh, uh, and, and disturbing uh, dis uh, uh, unevenness in the distribution of wealth within our own societies and globally. Um, there's an, too much power is concentrated with too few people and others feel alienated and pushed out. And this is endangering us. Not only is it endangering us physically and militarily, but it's endangering our very souls. This, these are religious issues. And it seemed to me for a long time that uh, unless we learn to apply what's called the golden rule globally, treating all peoples, whoever they are, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, we're not going to have a viable world uh, to hand on to the next generation. And it was a source of frustration to me that religion, which should be uh, making such a powerful contribution to this task of our generation, which is to build a global society where people of all persuasions can live together in harmony, Religion, which should be making such a contribution, is often seen as part of the problem. Um, and yet, wherever I go in the world, east or west, I find a hunger for a more compassionate religion. Um, so I, I, the Charter, I wanted it to empower people. It's been created by hundreds of thousands of people 
who contributed online on a multilingual website contributed their ideas. Their ideas were considered by a panel of uh, people representing six religious traditions. Um, and together we produced this charter at a time when the religions are often seen at loggerheads and in deep and dire conflict. This was a cooperative effort, a demonstration that we can work together, whatever our beliefs, for a more just and compassionate world. That what, despite our many revealing and significant and important differences, this we have in common. Um, and if religious people of the world united in this, in practical action, uh, they could make a great impact. So today we had the launch of the Charter, but the launch is only the beginning of a journey not the end. Uh, it's, um, well, there's a lot of work still to be done. We now have 125 uh, partners worldwide and it's growing daily. People have been signing on to the charter all day online. Um, the idea is spreading, but we can't stop there. Part, the partners will have their own uh, website in which we can communicate with each other and work as a team instead of working in isolation. It's wonderful to have you uh, on that as partners. Um, but it's a call to action, the Charter. It's not just a question of us falling into each other's arms and we it, it requires effort uh, because many people don't want to be compassionate. Uh, they'd rather be right. And, um, uh, and it goes against so many of our instincts. And our, our societies are not particularly compassionate. We like to say how compassionate we are, but we know how often illiberal we are, how quickly we judge, how aggressive we are. Our modernity has been, I'm very glad to be um, a, a modern person. I can imagine no other time at w when, as a woman, I would have felt remotely comfortable. But I've had a very privileged life. Um, and our modernity has been spectacularly violent. Not, just, not because we're any more aggressive than our forebears, but because we've created the technology that's enabled us to kill more people more efficiently than ever before. This is time if we are to, ho we are holding our future in the palms of our hands. And it's time now to pull together. I'm hoping for practical initiatives to, con to continue. One of the things I've thought of doing was uh, building up something like we have in the uh, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, a rapid response team. So that when a, a situation occurs where a compassionate voice is needed, there are people positioned all around the globe who can write op-ed articles, appear on the media, um, and bring a compassionate voice to the table. Um, so I, I, I would like it, we need to get uh, it, the charter into educational establishments so that young people are schooled from the very beginning to treat each other and uh, treat other people with absolute respect, so to learn to respect and even appreciate difference. And we need to make the compassionate voice of religion articulate in a time when all too often it's drowned out by the voices of extremism. Uh, we need a compassionate media, and we need also an intellectual jihad, if I may say so, an intellectual struggle. Um, in order to, uh, if we are to treat other people as we wish to be treated ourselves, we must know other people. And that's why Dahlia's work has been so important, why your work is so important in bring, make, helping us, as the Quran says, to get to know one another. O oh, people, we have formed you from a man and a woman and formed you into tribes and nations so that you may know one another, get to know one another. Uh, and in countering the stereotypes, uh, you are helping us to build a more compassionate world. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for partnering us. 
thank you for inviting me here tonight at the end of a long day. It's been wonderful to end this day with you. Um, and God bless you all. We walk, we're going to work together uh, for a more compassionate world. And we can do it, inshallah. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, introduce the film tonight. Um, some of you uh, who may have heard me speak before know that I like to start my talks with a particular joke uh, that I think is really uh, an important, um, you know, if you remember nothing else from tonight's event, no, not a word that I say, not an uh, not a item from the film. If you remember the punchline of this joke, I always think that you'll have a handle on how to actually build a more compassionate world. Uh, and it was a joke that I heard at a conference on the clash of civilizations. And at this conference, it was, you know, a lot of academics reading papers and making uh, various speeches. And I, at the end of it, was like no closer to having a handle on the clash of civilizations than I was coming in. And then, in the last plenary session, a rabbi, uh, who I actually had uh, spoken to a few times, stood up and he told the joke I'm about to share with you. Uh, and a joke the rabbi told takes place uh, in the Middle Ages in Rome at a time when the Jewish community and the Catholic community aren't getting along. So the Pope calls in the head rabbi and says, I think it's best that the Jews would just leave Rome. The rabbi says, let me make a deal with you. Let's have a theological debate, you and me. If we win, if I win, we get to stay. If I lose, we'll leave without a fight. The Pope says, OK, but under one condition. This debate has to happen non-verbally. No talking allowed in this debate, <laughs> which is, of course, weird terms for debate, but the rabbi is in no position to refuse, so he accepts. And this becomes a big deal. They have to build a stage in the middle of one of the piazzas in Rome. Thousands and thousands of people come to see the debate. The pope comes up on one side, the rabbi comes up on the other, and the debate begins. First, the pope puts up three fingers like this. Without a moment's hesitation, the rabbi puts up one. The pope nods thoughtfully. He makes a gesture like this over his head. Again, without a moment's hesitation, the rabbi points firmly to the ground. Once more, the pope nods. He's clearly impressed. And he's brought with him the communion wafer and wine on a table. And he picks it up and he holds it for the rabbi to see. Now, for the first time, the rabbi seems stumped. Thinks, shrugs. He reaches his cloak. He pulls out an apple. At that po point, the pope says, the debate's over. The rabbi wins. The Jews can stay in Rome. Down the stage he goes. And he's surrounded by the cardinals and the bishops. And they say, what was this about? He said, oh, it was a fascinating debate. First, I put up three fingers like this to signify the Trinity. The rabbi raised one to remind me we share one God in common. So I made a gesture like this to say that God sits in his majesty in the heavens above. The rabbi pointed to the ground to remind me of God's on earth watching and judging. So I took out the wine and the bread to signify redemption. And he pulled out the apple to remind me of the sin of Adam, which we all share in common. Now, the same conversation was having the rabbi and his followers. The rabbi said, yeah, it was a really weird debate. <laughs> First, the Pope put up three fingers to say the Jews had to leave Rome in three days. <laughs> I said, that one of us is going to go. <laughs> and then he got frustrated. He said, no, the Jews have to leave Rome. I said, we're staying where we are. <laughs> and then the weirdest part of all, he took out his lunch, so I took out mine. <laughs> <laughs> I like that joke. <laughs> and the punchline is the important thing. Because what the punchline says is this. We may not be facing so much a clash of civilizations. In other words, it's not in the DNA for groups and religions to fight. But when we have a clash of misunderstandings, when we are in the dark about what another people believes or thinks, what their stories are, what they really care about, when we don't know that, we can actually create clashes that lead, not in the case of this joke, to comedy, but more often to tragedy. 
So one of the things that um, our company, Unity Productions Foundation, has been doing for the last eight years is trying to make documentary films that try to shed some light on uh, debates and arguments that have been generating mainly heat uh, for these last several years by focusing and trying to tell the stories of Muslims and Islam. Tonight, uh, we are very pleased to be here uh, on this auspicious uh, moment of uh, the Charter for Compassion's launch to premiere uh, this evening the, our newest film, Inside Islam, What a Billion Muslims Really Think. And before I say another word, I want to thank CSIS for hosting us, and I'd like everyone to give them a big round of applause. Now, I'm always asked, you know, why did you make this film, or why do you make any documentary film? Documentary films usually begin with a question, a question that the filmmaker has that leads them on a quest. And the quest becomes the film that you eventually see. Now, in the case of this particular film, there were actually several questions that were floating around that got us going. The first one being, well, is there a clash of civilization? We were asking, uh, can Muslim women achieve gender equality uh, in Islamic societies? Uh, or must Islamic law be abandoned for that to be possible? Why is there so much anti-Americanism in the Muslim world? Is Islam responsible for terrorism? And if it's not, what explains why the radicals act the way they do? Now, these questions were not new to us. They've been floating around, hotly debated by pundits and experts and pseudo-experts, politicians. We have late-night comics weighing in and various hate-filled shock jocks uh, coming with their opinions, uh, and not to be left out of it, occasionally Osama bin Laden registers his opinion on, on what Muslims think, and uh, following the very tragic events last week at Fort Hood, uh, we now have people debating whether uh, this man, Nidal Hassan, uh, whether he represents what Muslims think or not. And in all of this loud and crowded cacophony of opinions and voices arguing one way or the other about what Muslims actually think, there's been one group who's not been asked, one voice left out of this discussion, and that is the voice of the world's Muslims themselves. So when we heard that Gallup was undertaking the first ever world poll of Muslim public opinion, we knew that this was a film that we had to make. This was information that had to get out to a large audience in a way that only a documentary film can do. And so we bravely decided to take this on. And I say bravely because, keep in mind, this is a film about data. <laughs> How do you make that not be a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> Very difficult. But, um, helped um, enormously by uh, really the star of the show, um, and that is Dalia Mogahed, who is with us. And Dalia, please stand up and take a little round of applause. <laughs> and you'll see what I mean when you see the film. Uh, but helped enormously by her personality and her presence um, in, in, in really articulating this data we were able to do it. Now, some of what you're going to hear tonight is not going to surprise you at all. It, like, for example, learning that Muslims worldwide uh, um, are upset about the Iraq war. But some of it you might find very surprising. Like, for example, among the most militant and aggressively anti-American voices that the Gallup people found when asked in this poll, in this world poll, uh, how many of them justified those feelings by religion or by Quranic verses? Not one, not a single one of them answered that religion with that question with a religious uh, edict or a scriptural verse. And that is why we view the Muslim world as an up to now silenced majority. And I use that word silenced uh, with intention because I can tell you one thing for sure. Osama bin Laden does not want you to know what a billion Muslims really think. Ayman al-Zawariya does not want you to know what a billion Muslims think. 
And as the Washington Post reported just a few days ago, this radical uh, Yemeni uh, sheik who apparently uh, Nadal Hassan was in some contact with, he commented, lashing out, condemning and threatening the American Muslim community and the American Muslim organizations and Arabic organizations for their condemnation of this attack, saying that they are out of sync with what Muslims really think, that American Muslims somehow are beyond the pale. He doesn't want you to know what the world's Muslims think. Because if that voice becomes known, then these people will be revealed for how marginalized figures they really are. And it will upset their entire strategy. And they have a strategy. It was something that I learned myself 30 years ago when I was exposed to terrorism for the first time. 30 years ago, I was a student, an exchange student, uh, in Rome, Italy, doing a semester abroad. And this was the 1970s, and some of you may remember there was a Stalinist, Leninist, radical group in, in Rome called the Red Brigades. And the Red Brigades wanted to overthrow the democratically elected uh, Italian government and establish a Stalinist regime in Italy. And they, of course, had all the, uh, the words that you associate with radical you know, people trying to revolutionize the world. They said nice things about the people, liberating the people from their slave, uh, slavery of uh, the capitalist system, so on and so forth. But how are they trying to accomplish this? They invented something you may have heard of called kneecapping, which is they would randomly shoot people in the legs. While I was there, they kidnapped a very popular and beloved prime minister named Aldo Moro. They held him hostage for 50 days, and then they murdered him. And then one afternoon, I was walking down a street, a street that I frequently passed on my way to school, and a bomb went off in a waste can. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was injured. But that wasn't the intention of the Red Brigades because it was set off in the middle of the afternoon. It was a very crowded street. A few seconds sooner, a few seconds later, there would have been casualties. But fortunately, there was none. But it left me absolutely perplexed, bewildered. I could not understand how it was that people who said that they were trying to lead a popular revolution could ever accomplish that goal by doing indiscriminate attacks against civilians. Then I learned the answer about two weeks later. We were in class, and one of our professors, an Italian professor, was late. And when he arrived, he told us why he had been delayed. Now, this guy was a youngish guy. He sported kind of a little Che Guevara beard. He liked to wear a Che Guevara uh, beret, he wore a green fatigue coat. You know, he, he was a leftist. He was a socialist or communist p party member in Italy. And he was riding his bike with a satchel, and two machine gun wielding policemen, Italian policemen, stopped him. And they wanted to see what was in the satchel, and they began questioning him and, at, and, and giving him a hard time for how he was dressed. And before it was done, one of them had slapped a beret off his head, and they had roughed him up. And so he was very shaken up when he came to class. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, this is exactly what the Red Brigades want to have happen. This is exactly what they want. Because they, by themselves, are too tiny and too small to ever provoke any kind of revolution. But if they can provoke the authorities to begin looking at everybody who dresses a certain way, who affiliates in a certain political direction as a Red Brigade member, and to get all those people treated that way, then they hoped that they could undermine the Italian government from within and to create a popular anger against it. There is nothing that the, smell, the relatively small number of, uh, of extremists in the Muslim world want more than to have the voice of a billion Muslims ignored. Because they do hate us for our freedom, but they could never, ever undermine our freedom by any act that they can take. Their only power is fear. And their only power is trying to claim the right to speak for the Muslim world, a right they do not have. And so as this information gets out, they hopefully will become a much more marginalized uh, uh, force, not only in the minds of we here in the West, but also in the minds of Muslims worldwide. Because just in the same way that a Gallup poll tells us sometimes, wow, my views are more in the majority than I ever thought. In all the, all the Muslim societies around the world where there is intimidation, where people may be silent because they fear that maybe I'm the only person who thinks this way, as this information comes out to them as well, 
to know how much in the majority their mainstream views actually are. We hope it can be an empowerment for the Muslims around the world as well. And to that end, I am very happy to let you know that the film has already had its broadcast premiere. And that was on the Middle East broadcasting station Al Arabiya, where it ran several times during the last week of Ramadan. So that's a great thing and a great start uh, for this effort. We must know this information. Not every fact is something we can act upon. Just by the fact that we acknowledge it doesn't mean we have to agree with it. But every fact can help us overcome our fears. It can meet our challenges and help beat those who are enemies of peace by learning more. Understanding and knowledge are not only among the best weapons, they are the only weapons that will ever ultimately defeat this enemy. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only the light can do that. I hope you find some light in learning what a billion Muslims really think. Thank you very much. Conversations like, so where are you from? Where are you headed? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I'm gonna die. <laughs> he was bringing a moral, ethical, social message to his people that we're all in the same boat before God and we must treat each other well with compassion and justice um, and equity. When there is diversity, there is, by definition, friction. But of course, if you eliminate diversity, you wouldn't everyone be the same, there'd be no friction, but there'd be no creativity that results 